Welcome to the Outer Realm with Michelle DeRoche and Amelia Passano. Airing live on the United Public Radio Network, 105.3 FM in New Orleans. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Thursday night segment of The Outer Realm. We are broadcasting live on the United Public Radio Network, UFO, Paranormal Radio Network, 105.3 and 107.7 FM from the beautiful city of New Orleans. We are fully sponsored by the amazing people over at Folgers Coffee who have been a part of our journey since the very beginning. So thank you, Folgers. We couldn't do it without you, nor would we want to. Also, big thank you to Justin Snicker, a.k.a. Dr. Snick, the sonic surgeon, for his contribution of his time, his music, and his voice for the intro that you just heard and the outro that doesn't get played as often as we'd like, uh, as we just usually make it right to the very end. So thank you to him. You can find all of his music on your favorite streaming music platforms. And note that he is an award-winning composer who specializes in Halloween horror, sci-fi, and dark wave electronic music. Also, big thank you to Steve McGinnis, the artist behind the banners and logos here at the Outer Realm. Check him out on Facebook and Instagram. Also specializes in the horror genre, but does phenomenal commission pieces. You can do comic books, graphic novels, you name it, this guy does it. So big happy Thanksgiving to all of our friends and listeners. And of course, you know, our producer, Joe Montaldo, um, owner of the station out of New Orleans. So big, big, big happy Thanksgiving to all of you happy guys. Turkey Hope and ham day. I know. I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> I, I've had a, a couple of hosts message me today going, I'm think I'm in a food coma. I'm dying. We're not done yet. I was like, it's not good. But must be nice because I'm fun. starving over here. <laughs> I know. So it's like, wow, excellent. Yeah, and so, Nutella so, for lunch and dinner, like together <laughs> at the same time. So big, big, big happy Thanksgiving. And um, yeah, but we oh, have one, so one trooper. One trooper out of all this, and that's Dr. Arlen Andrews Sr., who's taken the time to be with us to discuss the Thaw Trilogy series. Um, this is going to be really interesting because we don't normally, you know, talk a whole lot about um, with, with fiction um, authors and so on. Not because we didn't like to, but because we have so many other shows on the network who do just that sort of thing. But what was different about it is that he wrote the book or the, this trilogy after he had been to Peru. And if you guys remember him from the mm -hmm. last show um, where he talked about the, I, I always pulverize this word, Kilaramayuk, Mayok, maybe that makes sense. The Lost Secrets of the Shadow Machine, which was an yeah. ancient enigma of Peru revealed. So I, I had to bring this up to read it because... Clearly, it's an issue with my trying to pronounce it, but it, <laughs> I know, right? You blah, 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 blah. Yeah. It doesn't not roll off the tongue, but it left enough of a mark on him that he basically decided to write this series. And it's going to be interesting because it's sort of post Ice Age and, and things like that, but we're going to get into a lot of different things, perhaps, as to what would future, you know, civilizations or generations think if, if we actually were living through this sort of thing? And what do we think as a people when we think back to all of these things that are surfacing now, ancient civilizations and things like that? So I thought, you know what, this is going to be super interesting because it's, it's just something that we all kind of wonder about. I mean, I, right? I posted something on our page regarding finding a burial of a Merovingian. Really? 
<laughs> yeah. And I can't remember the rest of it. So, cause I wasn't, <laughs> so, you know, me and my memory because of my meds, it's like, <laughs> my if, meds, you, so if meds. you need yeah. someone to vent to and forget what you said, tell me. That's why my confidentiality <laughs> works so well, because I can't remember a damn thing. I think that God made me that way or whoever made me that way because of the work that I do. I have to oh, be confidential. So absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I remember that I posted it today. But um, yeah. You just ask her something she'll go, I don't know. Be, but like how there's not supposed to be any more um, of these tombs, these graves, and they found there. it intact. They're there. With everything. Sure. So I posted it on our page. Take a look at it. Not now. Take a look at it after. Yeah, but after if, the show. I, I'm going to go look at it because look? that's. Yeah. That's 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 some history. Well, I, I know quite a bit about this history. So this will be really fabulous. I get a lot of my stuff from Ancient Origins, but I check everything. I, um, I have a membership with them. I, I actually love, love them. them. I yeah. learned so much from them because I'm trying yeah. to keep up with our guests because this is all new to me. Right. So I have a membership with them and I get that newsletter and I posted that article. You're welcome. <laughs> because, because you have to pay to read this. So I right. share it with everybody on the page because I thought it was really interesting, you know, to, to see something like that and, and to I've been told for years and years and years that this doesn't exist. And that well, fits. That, and they go back to tonight. Ren Le Chateau. Let's spin off of what we were talking about last night. There's a huge yeah. movement again, a, a whole, whole culture and history that surrounds them with Ren Le Chateau among many areas, but especially out in the Languedoc area of the South of France. So it's yeah. really, it's really just... fascinating stuff. Especially when it comes to Ren the Chateau for you know, many different it's reasons. It's just crazy, right? Like yes. It, ancient yeah. origins, yes. Frankish warrior grave. Armed to the teeth. Frankish warriors untouched grave found. Mm. So I I, like I think that. it's fantastic. And yes. I like the article. And like I said, if you know, if you're interested, subscribe to them or you know, they they have a lot of really well-researched pieces that they share and they email them to you. Yeah, so. they're, they're excellent. I've, I've been a subscriber of theirs um, for a pretty long time, actually, especially when researching stuff for the gray zone. Uh, I'll tell you, like there's so much information there yeah. um, that it's worth. And you, it's and you can, trip. yeah, it's awesome. And you can, you can mark them so that, you read it later. If yeah. you don't have the time and you're interested, you just click read later and they hold yeah. it aside for you on your yeah. account. So I really like it. Yeah. But I enjoy it. I enjoy learning a lot of some stuff. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. It's like, no, no, no. But some this one goes, caught my in-depth. eye because of yesterday's show. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we are just waiting for our guests to come in guys. So we're not just trying yeah. to, to I look be like Casper um, the friendly ghost. Okay. Hold like, on a minute here. So white. Requesting. Okay, so there it is. Yeah, sent it. I've sent it. Okay. Sent. That was very nice of him to be on tonight. It is Thanksgiving. He goes, oh my goodness, it's Thanksgiving. And people are like, well, you're live on Thanksgiving. But it, it, again, it's to remember this too, is we have a huge, huge listenership. And it's from all over the world. I mean, we have people from all over the world who aren't th celebrating Thanksgiving. This is American Thanksgiving. Canada had, you know, had theirs in um, October, October. Even though we so, have many messages wishing us a happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. So, you know, we actually we, have, we, we have actually whole... had it years before the states too. <laughs> I know. Like, so <laughs> almost a hundred. Just saying. <laughs> I know. I know. There's so much stuff I want to talk about. Like, mm -hmm. and, and I, I can't get ahead of myself <laughs> because we have to wait for him to arrive and, and start talking. But man, I love really ancient history and I love to research it. And when mm -hmm. you're getting into things that are pre ice age, just talking about things that's ice age related is tough because. You know, we've got this religious conditioning that are kind of going. I was what? just going to say, but there's so politics. Yeah. yeah, 
but there's so much stuff that is out there and surfacing. It's just fantastic. Oh, and our guest of honor is just I don't popping understand. in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so are you ready, Arlen? My iPhone, but on my laptop, all hey. I see is myself. This is great. Oh. We can hear you. We can see you. This is fantastic. You can't see us, though. I do see you. I see oh, you. Oh, yay. Excellent. How are you? Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, thank you. I'm full of turkey right now. so oh. Don't fall asleep on us because we I know, know what happens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody wants to sleep after turkey dinner. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, welcome to the show. This is your second time with us, and we're so pleased that you are you decided to come and uh, spend part of your Thanksgiving with us. There's a lot of people from all over the world who will be listening who don't have Thanksgiving, so they're always happy to tune in. And you're going to be talking about the Thaw Trilogy, which is interesting to me because it, it's just out of the norm for us but when you mentioned that you wrote it after you've been to peru everything started to make sense yes yeah <laughs> so why don't you start with um do you want to touch let's touch for those who haven't yet gone to the archive to watch the peru show people you're gonna to have to go back and find it but why don't you touch a little bit on your discovery um in peru and what led you and inspired you to write this series okay uh long story sh pretty short the entire long story is in the book a book called Kia Romeoak Lost Secrets of uh, the Shadow Machine. Yes. In twenty in twenty twelve, I was in Peru and I, by accident, came across a uh, sculpture that was carved into the side of a big rock, about a mile from the highway. It's a sculpt. It's a rainbow shaped sculpture, about eight and a half feet wide, three feet high, and two feet deep. It had a lot of uh, markings along the side, and there was no. Uh, there were no references to it. Even that night later when we returned to Cusco, I couldn't find any references on the, the internet except the fact it's there. Nobody knew what it was. There were no books about it. Uh, nobody knew if it was just an ornamental uh, symbol of some sort or mm -hmm. if it had a meaning. Well, as an engineer, when I see people going to a lot of trouble to carve something into the side of a big rock, mm. big limestone rock, I figured it must have a purpose because it's out of reach. Not many people can see it. Uh, when you get close to it, it's pretty crudely chopped, chopped in place. But when you get back about 20, 30 feet from it, it's beautiful. It's nice and pretty. I, I call it the stone rainbow. They call it Kia Rumiak, which means this, the stone that belongs to the moon. Wow. So as an, so as an engineer, I uh, had some measurements made of it. I made some computer models. And I say, well, now, if the shadows in this thing are meaningful, that might mean it's a calendar. I thought it was a solar calendar. My first impression, it was a solar calendar. Now, with my model, I was able to bring up the sun at any time, any year, up for the last 2,000 years. Uh, wow. Computer uh, modeling is really great. And I was able to determine that this machine, I call it the shadow machine because of its shadows, it was tell you when there was an equinox and a solstice, the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, three quarters mm. of the year, and that the ancient people could use this just by looking at it. A trained person could look at it and tell when the year began and where the year ended and the halfway through each quarter as well. And so uh, that would be very important to people who uh, raise crops. They need to know when the crops need to be harvested, when they need to be planted when the new year was in the fall. And mm -hmm. so with my computer models, approximate models, I was able to prove to my satisfaction that this works. And in fact, on the solstice, there are half a dozen phenomena that occur during this four day period. They call it the standstill of the sun, which they still celebrate in Peru. It's called Inti Rami. Rami is, or Inti is their god of the sun. 
in yeah. Rami during the celebration. So during the celebration of the sun for four days in Peru in the in the June solstice, June uh, 21st to 25th, roughly. Right. Peru is a big party. Right. Street, street parades, noise 24-7, a lot of drinking and uh, my brother and I were there. Uh, <laughs> They're very festive, the Peruvians. <laughs> right. And uh, so, but the thing is, nowhere in any archaeological things that I could ever find in a couple of years of searching that I ever find a technical paper written about it or any analysis that showed what I found. So right. I'm claiming that I'm the, the discoverer of the purpose of Kia Romeoch. And I hope someday to get a professional archaeologist to agree with me and let's publish a paper. And I think the, the thing should be a, a, a UNESCO, United Nations World Heritage Site. Right. Right now, Right now, it's basically ignored, and uh, it should be as to me as famous as Machu Picchu or these other places. Right. And right now, because, right now, because it's, it's just off of a highway, isn't it? Like it's just. Well, it's a little town called San Miguel de Porres. And right. There, there's a little town there that's dirt poor, and I would love to see tourism. Yes. Tourism's not going to bother anything because you can't get to it. It's eight feet up. I mean, I climbed right. up to it. You've got a picture of me there sitting in it, which you're yes. not supposed to do. Yes. Do that. <gasps> oh, but, uh, that's right. It's, it's, it's out of the way. Uh, not many people can gather around to watch it. A couple dozen probably could, but I think in the old days, whenever it was created, at least 500 years ago, maybe thousands, it's hard, nobody can tell. Mm -hmm. uh, it was meant to be viewed, it was an instrument. Right. It's, it's a, a small instrument. Now, in Cusco, before the Spaniards destroyed it all, they used to have huge pillars that uh, the shadows would show you when the equinoxes were and the solstices and everything and hundreds or thousands of people could gather and look at it. Right. Well, that, that would be like big, big Ben clock in London. Whereas sure, Kiarubiak right. Rubio, Kia is more like your grandfather clock in the hallway. You know, this one or two people are going to look at it, right. but it was still, it was still important. It was a, I, right. in an agricultural, agricultural I society, uh, knowing when the seasons begin and end is a life or death matter. The fact that it still exists is what's phenomenal, which I guess is going to roll us into um, the the Thoth trilogy. Um, sure. Because we can expand on on that from a historical standpoint as well, with you know recent discoveries and so on. So, what made you decide that this is this is what you wanted to do? Well, I'll tell you. I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. I lived across the street from the school. Our schoolyard was almost a forest. And all those kids used to dig in that, around the trees and mess with the trees, you know. We mm. always found arrowheads in the schoolyard, you know. And I always wow. wondered, you find these little arrowheads, what kind of people lived here hundreds or thousands of years ago? Then mm. downtown in Little Rock, there's a birthplace of General Douglas MacArthur. Mm. And they made it to a natural history museum. And in there, they had uh, things from uh, Middle America, Central America. Mm. They had ancient Indian stuff, and they had some phony stuff. And it fascinated me, because so I was always interested in it. Then when I became an engineer many years later, I always had in the back of my mind, you know, what, what did people like me do in the past? Well, you know, I wound up going to Stonehenge, and I went to the pyramids. Mm. I went to all kinds of Indian mounds around the U.S., and uh, a long story to get me to Peru, but I went to Peru twice. The first time looking at another thing and it came across Kiarumiak by almost by accident. Mm. The second time I went was in 2017 with my late brother. And we spent five or eight days there and went out to Kiarumiak a couple of times and took all kinds of videos that proved the shadows that I was looking for. It proved they were there. And so mm -hmm. people might argue with what I've found and, in my book, I speculate on some things and, and I demonstrate other things as fact. And the videos and pictures I took are facts. I can't argue with that. It does happen. Right. And anybody can go and see it anytime. Okay. Right. So one of the places we visited uh, both times was a place called Sex or Man, Sex or Woman, Sex or Woman. They call it Sexy Woman down there. <laughs> a bunch of huge gargantuan stones, megaliths outside the city of Cusco. And you've seen pictures of that. You're, they're rocks that are 20 feet wide and 30 feet tall and 20 feet thick. Hmm. Nobody knows how, where they came from or how they got there. 
but it was actually a fortress of some sort and the conquistadors and their infinite wisdom tore down as much as they could but the big rocks were just too big for them to, to mess with so they left them there uh and some of the rocks nearby there was a place they called it the upside down staircase there's a huge rock laying there and there's a staircase in it but the rock is upside down and they say well nobody knows why they made it well right next to it was a great, another great big rock it looked to me like the huge rock had been caught cut off or not cut off but had broken off and if you put it back together you would have a staircase going in a proper direction which is up wow and i got to thinking you know and reading and i said you know these things might be fifteen thousand years old they're not mm. here it, the inca couldn't have done it because the inca were only in power for a couple hundred years right and they, they couldn't have done all this stuff and right. so i sat down on the way home i sat down at the airport in lima with my little laptop and I started to think, what, what is it going to be like 10, 20, 30, 50,000 years from now? Not much of our civilization will be left, but some things will be. And what will the people then think about it? And that's what started it. Now, my whole life, or for many years, I've had a, almost a dream of a glacier retreating and of things coming out of the glacier and people finding it and wondering what it was. And when I sat down in Lima to start writing this thing, I immediately thought of a glacier. The glaciers can cause all this destruction. You know, it, it, a glacier that's a mile, two miles thick will destroy mm -hmm. anything. And mm -hmm. the next time it happens, you know, well, I got a, an email from a lady today in Scotland. She says, you know, uh, talking about global warming, she says, uh, where I am right now in, uh, in northern Scotland used to be under two kilometers of ice. <laughs> and so anything that was there was going to be crushed or scooped away so i had this i wanted to write a story about what would happen after the next ice age began to thaw in other mm -hmm. words what's going on during the ice age is probably not that interesting people are just trying to survive but after it's over and there will be another ice age i mean it happened yes if, yes there's a thing called the milankovitch cycles every hundred thousand years there's a tremendous drop in temperature and uh, it precipitates an ice age. Now, sometimes there are little intermediate ice ages, smaller ice ages in between every 10 or 20,000 years or something like that. But every 100,000 years now, going back for a million years, according to the data they've gathered in Greenland and Antarctica and the ice cores, there's a temperature drop. And actually, now we are due for another one. <laughs> and I hope it doesn't happen. So I you know, please burn your fossil fuels and everything else. Let's keep that sucker away because uh, coal kills. And the right. warm period, warm periods grow plants and crops and people, and mm -hmm. the cold periods kill things. But anyhow, in my story, you don't learn this until later. But basically, I'll tell you right now, and the, the, the spoiler thing: it takes place thirty thousand years from now, when the glacier the glaciers in North America and the rest of the world are starting to recede, have been receding for about a hundred years. And that's why I call it thaw. The, the world is thawing out. And the point of view characters in my story start out, they are small people. They're little, the men there and boys are like two and a half feet tall. They're mm -hmm. tiny by our standards. The reason they are, now the editor asked me when they were looking at the story for Analog Magazine back in 2012. Why, why are these people small? I said, well, they are in a place that was surrounded by glaciers, but their, their little area, about 100 miles wide and 150 miles long, was untouched by glaciers for some reason. So right. for 30,000 for 30, years, they were isolated there. And resources uh, were scarce. And so they diminished in size as time went on. Now, that similar thing happened in Indonesia. You might have heard about the hobbits over there they found. Yes. The hobbit skeletons. Well, this is the same thing that happened in, uh, the, in my book. I call it the Tharn's Land. The Tharn is a, is a, uh, a chief. And right. these people exist in a what we would call a Bronze Age, Iron Age society. Uh, they are totally male chauvinists. I mean, to them, in this society I'm talking about, in the Tharns land, 
Uh, first off, all males are born twins. Females are only born singletons. You learn that, but I, and it, it's never explicitly stated, but that's just what happens in the story. Mm -hmm. And there are genetic reasons for that, but they, uh, they're so small like that. And some of the wild birds that survive in this one area are a larger version of what we call emus. And so the upper classes in the Tharns land ride emus for transportation and for hunting. Hmm. They carry spears and they hunt. And uh, they make the most of their environment. Uh, since the glaciers are melting, occasionally ice breaks off it flows down the river that comes by their town. And to us now, that was that would be the headwaters of the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing takes place basically in the upper peninsula of uh, what we call Michigan. And that, that's I wrote, interesting. I wrote, I wrote that. And the funny thing was, I went up to a meeting up there. And, and the uh, some people in upper Michigan said, well, that's true. I said, what do you mean? She said, they said, oh, yeah, the glaciers avoided this place. I said, I had no idea. It's just part of the story. Thanks. So anyhow, these these two young guys and their father get into all kinds of adventures. And where there are, the women are, uh, I mean, they love their mother. They call it their birther, not their mother. And uh, they love them. But to them, women are just reproductive devices. They're, right. they, they love them, but right. they're, they don't have any rights or anything else. They're just there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this sets it up. So one of the brothers goes north with his father to find something in the ice. The other brother goes downstream because they sell icebergs to people who live in the warm lands hundreds of miles south. Hmm. And so this guy rides an iceberg down to sell it to the people down in the warm lands. And he encounters a totally different civilization. The warm land people are about our size. They're natural. You know, they're not stunted. And uh, they come in all colors and all hair colors. They, these people up north are all dark skinned, the color of mahogany, dark eyes, dark hair. Hmm. And uh, they get down to the place called the a place run by the, uh, the kingdom of the solar priest. That's what it amounts to about where Memphis is today. And these, he sees huge pyramids and huge temples and all these uh, tall people and the women are stunningly beautiful because they've never seen any, they've never seen shapely women. The women of Tharns land are differently endowed. And uh, these guys are just blows their mind. Well, they're built for babies. <laughs> for and, baby uh, making. They, they, they make babies up there. But anyhow, and <laughs> there are, there are physiological differences in males and females from Tharns land that I never described. But only allude to, but what makes them very attractive to pe normal sized people like us. Right. I don't, I don't get into that, but it's right. implied and that's understood, I think. Right. So anyhow, they run into a society that builds huge temples and they can't figure out how in the world they cut these stones, how they stack them like that. And, and uh, on and on. And then beyond that, the guy gets in all kind of trouble. One, one guy is called, his name is Wrist wrist like your wrist right. and his brother his twin brother who stayed home is named rusk right. <clears throat> and wrist goes on downstream he has to run away because they're they're out the solar priests are trying to kill him he runs down to the end and he encounters like a 2000 foot waterfall and that's what we would call the end of the mississippi river emptying into what is an empty gulf of mexico right Right. At, at the bottom of which, when he finally won't get to how he gets there, but he gets down into that area and finds a civilization that is totally matriarchal. I mean, absolute. Hmm. The the queen or the the mother of mother it's called motherland. The mother of motherland absolutely owns like chattel every single person in that entire kingdom, millions of people. And her daughters are princesses or one step below them and they own and they have absolute life and death over everybody and everything uh, just like one princess describes later it's like you know you're like my fingernail I, you know i can trim my fingernails doesn't bother me i can trim you it doesn't bother me 
And so <laughs> it's a real shock to him, but he learns and he grows. And he becomes actually, because he can ride a bird, he becomes a specialized warrior. Right. And uh, the place that they came from never heard of warfare. I mean, they killed, they killed birds and they killed uh, wolves and things like that, but they never thought of killing each other. Hmm. It's all these things that he runs into are just a total shock to him. They torture, they kill. Uh, the people in his country don't know how to lie. Mm -hmm. And he learns, he learns to lie. He learns to kill. Mm -hmm. And he hates what he becomes. Meanwhile, his brother who stayed home, he and his father go up to the uh, glacier where some other creatures, young, some old, little, silly little things have found some things in the ice. And they found a, uh, what amounts to a nanotech built flying device. Hmm. It looks like a, what we would call a propane tank or something like that, but it's about 10 feet wide, 30 feet long. And they, they go through a bunch of problems to get it back down a hundred miles back to their, their house where they can work on it. And they eventually find out it can suspend itself. It's got all kind of no, nothing magic. It's all technology. They don't understand it. It looks like magic to them. And so the one kid goes off to search for his brother. And he gets involved in all those same adventures. Now, about one third of what I told you was a story in Analog Magazine in 2012. Mm -hmm. And the cover I sent you of Thaw there. Yeah, I, I, I just had it up. I'll get it back up here. It shows it one of the guys writing an emu. And uh, it was yep. funny, the cover won the best cover of analog for that year for 2012. Wow. My, sto my story, <laughs> my story didn't get anything. It, it wasn't even in the running, but the, uh, right. it, but they love the cover. Sometimes. It is a beautiful cover. It is. Oh, thank you. It is. There it is. There he is on top of and those are, and the people say, well, how come that bird is so big? I said, no, no, the guys are little. Right. That's like an emu or an ostrich. And the guy's yeah, like the size a, of a yeah, hobbit. It, it's something like that. It's going to, you know, it's going to, the species right. is going to change over thousands of years. Okay. So that first part was an analog. It was called Thaw. And then I wrote a, the next part called Flow, which tells about him getting down to the solar priest. Then I wrote a third novella for analog called uh, Fall, F-A-L-L, -L, mm -hmm. which he winds up going down where the women run everything. And he's nothing. Uh, the editor didn't buy the rest of them. So I went ahead and Put it, put it into a book. But then the little critters kept coming to my mind, like, hey, we got more to tell. We did more things than that. So I wound up doing two more books. And uh, if you put them all together, it's probably 400,000 words, all three books. Wow. Now, wow. the reason the Ice Age starts, I needed a way for it to start right away. I mean, first I wrote the story. And I filled it in later because I didn't know what I was writing. I, to me, it was like automatic writing. Um, I wrote this. I saw these. Little, I sat there in Lima. I saw these little guys on birds. And what the heck is this? And I started writing the story. And I have no idea where the stories come from. But it was almost like automatic writing. Mm -hmm. It just it developed all by itself. Hmm. And then, so I wrote the other books really to find out what was going on. I wanted to know what was going on. That's why I wrote the other books. Now, unfortunately for me, uh, the little guys are still yelling out for more things and prequels and sequels. And I don't know. I'll mm -hmm. see about that if I live long enough. But the uh, the point was, I wanted to. It, I realized it was, it was taking place after an ice age. Now, how did the ice age start? Well, the second book of the trilogy here is called Melt. Thaw then melt. Melt has at the end of it, it tells uh, about a hundred pages there. It tells what, what happened, but basically mm -hmm. there's a solar eruption that wipes out all our space stuff out over in Venus, Mercury and Venus, it wipes them out. And then it hits the back of the moon and wipes out all the colonies we have on the back of the moon. The ones in the front of the moon, the ones that live underground, uh, this is 200 years from now when the solar eruption occurs. 20, 22, 35 or something like that. Yeah. And uh, 
or 23, whatever, whatever it is, a couple hundred years right. from now. Right. There are people living on the moon. There are colonies on the moon. And it wipes out about half the Earth and precipitates an ice age that starts like right away. I mean, like within within months, screws up right. the world's whole the whole world's weather. And uh, you see, then my idea of what society might look like on Earth two hundred years from now, when when all this is occurring, and how some of the artifacts that they produced during that time wind up being very important to the story thirty thousand years later. Hmm. Now, when you build things on a nanotech, you build things at the quantum and molecular level with no moving parts, they're not going to wear out. Hmm. So they'll be just as functional in 30,000 years as they are now. Right. And one of the things that happened to me, I, I can't get into the details because I don't want to mess up somebody else's stuff. <laughs> but when thinking about this, I was talking to a friend who's writing books about real stuff. I was saying, what if in some of the things around the world, we're looking for ancient artifacts, we're looking at the wrong thing. What if technology 20,000 years ago was so advanced that they built things like what I call God spheres, yes. things about the size of a bowling ball that you, certain people touch them and knowledge comes out and you can interrogate them. It'd be like a, a quantum computer that you carry around. Right. It has, has everything in it. I mean, virtual reality and 3D, mm. everything. Right. So it's funny when you think about writing about the future, archaeologists finding things in the future, maybe we're looking at things right now that incorporate that technology. We, we don't realize it because we can't think that the ancients were smart enough to do that. Right. So anyhow, part of this, the second book takes place on the moon in the... Uh, underground uh, colonies or underground cities that survived and 30,000 years of living underground affects things too. Right. Now, one of the things I didn't mention about the Tharns land being that close to the glacier, they live under what they call the misty sky. They've never seen a clear sky. It's always misty or cloudy always because right. of the way the prevalent winds are. And so the people there, their eyesight, Developed there. All all the people in the Tharns land, including the little guys, Risk and Rusk, are uh, far sighted, extremely far sighted. They can't anything within arm's reach is totally out of focus. Anything beyond that, they can see. So they have no way of writing and understanding. So they carve. They they record things by wood, ivory, or any kind of uh, solid material. They carve in. They have a knife. And they carve their uh, what we call writing into that. So right. be, they call them a spindle. So you can pick up a spindle, and if you're trained in it, you can read the curves and the depths and everything else. And mm. it's almost like reading is to us. So when they get down to on the moon now, those people's living in the tunnels, their eyesight is totally changed after all these years. And most of them are very small too, for the same reasons. Uh, limited resources and limited food and uh, environmental pressures. And so, and there, there is a link. I won't go into it because it's too much to talk about. There is a, a technology that was left on earth that in our time or the time in a couple hundred years now was used to communicate with people on the moon. And they still have it in motherland that they think it's a magic throne that the mother sits on. And uh, there are some on the moon and they haven't been used in thousands of years. And every time she, uh, the mother tries to sit on it and get the messages from the goddess who runs everything, all she receives is garbage messages. Now, reading a book, you can understand what the message is, but she doesn't. It's a totally foreign language. She thinks the goddess is speaking to her. But the... Uh, what they don't realize and they haven't realized for thousands of years is a continued use of this communication device, this throne, the crystal throne, they call it, mm -hmm. uh, starts to degenerate the brain. So every mother that has ever been has become psychotic, raving psychotic, and they're usually killed by their own daughters. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of world building in here. <laughs> it gets nasty. 
Right. And uh, right. so then there's societies on the moon, societies on the earth. And then one of our little heroes, one of the guys, actually has occasion to get on that throne. And he makes contact with a young woman on the moon. And they're able to exchange information. And the and they both learn through the computers on the moon what ha actually happened to mess up the world. <clears throat> and so around the world, now that that's that's the second book, and there's all kind of fighting and wars going on. Unfortunately, that this happens. It's not the primary part of the book, but it does happen that there's warfare involved, and brutality and meanness and all that stuff, like humans always do. And then the in the third one. It goes into what other societies around the world have been doing during this ice age. And it's called Flow, F L O E. <clears throat> and it begins on an ice flow around, uh, around what we would call Scandinavia. There are ice pirates who have big boats that ice boats that skid on the ice and they raid other places. And uh, they wind up encountering. The people from the motherland and all kind of hilarity ensues after that uh, there's there's killings and there's education and uh, the main thing is the people change the young guys from this semi-barbaric society become sophisticated and they learn uh, about the broader world they burn they learn about absolute history this flying craft carries with it quantum computers and it, it has all of human history on there. Mm. These guys look at it and they think, well, that's pretty cool, but that, those people are mean. We don't want, we don't want devices that can wipe out cities. We don't want to hurt other people. And so we mm. don't like that old world. We don't want to bring the old world back. Mm. <laughs> so they look back on our world as uh -uh, like we right. would look back on, on the Romans or somebody. Uh -uh, we don't want to do that. Right. So, and there's, there's 400,000 words of this kind of stuff. It sounds so a lot like the planet of the apes, you know, it takes you back to being advanced in their own right for a primitive time. But when they come across all the futuristic stuff and they see mm -hmm. how they came to be where they are, it's like, I mean, it's pretty shocking. Yeah. Well, all, all these things play. I mean, that's my idea was that in science fiction, not all science fiction the future doesn't always mean spaceships and the uh, robots, right. you know, right. It, it, uh, the world will undergo another ice age sometime. I don't know right. hundred years now, or a thousand or 10,000, but it will do it. And when it does, it's going to destroy the physical infrastructure of half of the world, at least. Right. I'm hoping that Elon can get his rockets going to Mars and other places so that some people will be away from here when that happens. We I will think, be a multi Yeah, a multi I think. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you're our guest, please. No, I, I want us to be a multiplanetary society. Back, back in 1992, I went to work at the White House Science Office as a fellow, and uh, one of the men there, a Dr. Bill Phillips, very good guy, says, "I understand you're interested in space. How come we want to go to the Moon and Mars? Who cares? We got problems on Earth." I said, well, Dr. Phillips, this way, all the human race is on one little mud ball, mm. one place. If there's a plague, a comet, a nuclear war, something right. goes astray, we could lose everybody and everything, and that's it. But if we have some people on the moon or Mars uh, scattered around through space, other planets, uh, it's going to take a lot to wipe out, out everybody. And I'd like to think that uh, some people will survive all get all of our eggs out of the same basket. Right. And Dr. Phillips said, you know, nobody has ever explained it to me that way. So I totally agree with you. I'll support that. And that's one of the reasons I got into the White House Science Office for a year. Right, right. 30 years I mean, ago. you think about it, it does. It makes a lot of sense, you know. But I mean, what, if, I mean, I guess an ice age. An ice age typically would happen towards the northern part of the globe, what it I happened up. Saying? Well, it comes up from Antarctica too. That way, also, right, it right. Hit south, yes. hit south America. 
And if you had a solar catastrophe like I talked about in the book, then uh, no telling what it could be. Mm -hmm. But like I say, you put suddenly put two miles of ice over where Indianapolis and New York mm -hmm. and Philadelphia are. Uh, the yeah. world's going to change a lot. And then, of course, Moscow and the Scandinavian countries would totally be gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, the oceans would flow differently. There wouldn't be a Gulf Stream anymore. Mm -hmm. So Europe would freeze. Uh, who knows? Right. Who knows what? It, it, would, it would be a mess. Right. And, and in, in my scenario, with the sun erupted like that, it caused more than just the ice age. I mean, the solar radiation and heat killed a lot of people, and only only a few thousand who were underground survived. Basically, mm -hmm. and I tell how that occurred. One of the people went underground, right. and uh, right. you know, it's, it's fiction, but it's, it's food for thought. And like I said, when I was writing it, it was more like automatic writing. I, my wife said, how come you're spending so much time on that? I said, well, I want to know what these guys are doing. <laughs> I right. want to see it. I, I, watch, I would love to be able to go straight from my mind to video and not have to worry about the fingers and the keyboard and all that <laughs> stuff. Well, because that interferes with the thought process. You can't get it, it out exactly the way you see it. Can you just yes. speak in a recorder? I'm sorry? Can you speak hmm. into a recorder? I've done that with automatic writing. Instead of writing, I've had... Well, where I was just recording everything that was coming to me. My friends have recommended that I do that, and I, yeah, I don't know. I've been writing with my finger fingers on keyboard since I was fourteen years old. Yeah. Like well, eventually you got to get to that process, <laughs> right? Eventually you have to get it down from on the keyboard. Yeah, so well, I, you can do voice to text, right? There's, I know it's scary to try something new because you think, am I going to miss something? Well, I've, I've been tempted to do it. I just haven't yet. If, if my arthritis yeah. keeps up on my fingers and my shoulders, and every place else, I might have to do it. Just. <laughs> yeah, I know but, how that uh, feels. My hands. You know, yeah. When I, when I think of the last ice age, for example, like what you know, you were talking about how people react when they find you know, traces of, of the last civilization. I mean, and it was interesting when your story, you said your story took place up near Michigan because there is a Stonehenge in Lake Michigan and near the Stonehenge that they found this ancient monument. Now that was completely underwater at one time pre ice age, it was above water, but there's also a stone that they found with a mastodon carved and painted on it. And it's all underwater. Yeah, things change. You know, it, it's the world crazy changes. Crazy though, isn't it? Like to me, well, I would find that fascinating. But yeah I, yeah, I really wish they would spend more time and money to go down and retrieve those things, record them, or do something. So yes. they were, but a, a similar thing happened. I heard about it many years ago. I was always interested in Loch Ness. I, I went, I went a couple times. Right. Scotland, and it turns out one time when they were doing radar sonar underground and underwater in Loch Ness, they found a stone circle at the bottom of Loch Ness too. See, now mm. that that cracked. It might Scotland cracked like that like millions of years ago, but the locks might not have filled until uh, after the last ice age, ice age melted and raised the water levels. But I, right. I I read that one time, and I've never seen anything about it since then. Even when I went there, I asked the people at the museum, have you t ever heard about that? Oh, no, no, nothing. Right, right. But, but um, the, world, the world has changed a lot, and uh, we ignore most of it, it seems like. I'm just actually pulling something up that I'm going to share with you. I'm hoping that you can, you'll can you be able to see it from your phone. Because if you've not seen these, then I definitely want to show them. So... Just because there there are people who are watching, so if you can bear with me, oh, you're kind of crooked there. So oh, it just okay. perfect. Okay, one second. Okay, I'm gonna have to, so I'm going. I'm, gonna I'm going to, to share this. So these are just the different um, photographs. Um, here's the, the stone structure found in Lake Michigan. Oh wow! There's a stone with a mastodon. 
I, you know, this seen, is the I same. Some, go ahead. Some, I have seen some of these before. Yeah. Aren't they fantastic? I mean, there's this is the stone with the mastodon um, with yeah. a diver over it, just to, to give you an idea. And here's the overhead. So right there is the overhead. Um, let's see if I can come up a little bit so they give you more. So, I mean, this is, and this is where it is in Lake Michigan, like right up in, hold on, right up in here. So there's all kinds of rock formations. There's all kinds of, you know, stone structures that are all just standing. Yeah, I have, I have read too that there are uh, a, a line of structures between two of the lakes that are, They've been underwater for at least 10,000 years, too. And in addition to this, there was another thing I saw in a television program about a series right. of, I don't know, a road or a, something. I had to, pardon me, I had to put in my readers here. I had, since we talked last, I had cataract surgery and it's messed up my close vision. Oh, no. Okay, I'm sorry I, I to hear that. Yeah. I wouldn't have, had, wouldn't have had it done if I had known it was going to do that. Now I can't see close up. I'm about like my guys on my story. I can't see things right. when I'm on the no, Not good. <laughs> Try getting the lenses, Arlen. I, well, they told me it wouldn't be good. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I can't, so I, I can't do it yet. So I've got readers. I did the LASIK thing and lost my, my, uh, <laughs> my ability to see up close. But I have 2020 vision at a distance, and it's been like that for over 15 years. <laughs> but I can't see my food in front of me. Yeah, well, I'm, I have good vision beyond my arm's length. Far away. I can yeah. read the books, my shelves, but I can't read. <laughs> I I'm can't exactly read. like you. I know your pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny. I, I talk about those guys having that problem, and now I have it myself. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I... Uh, I'm a member of the ancient Kentucky historical association down here in Louisville. And, uh, we always have speakers coming in talking about ancient stuff. Uh, sometimes I would like to recommend you, uh, talk to my friend who is the president of that group, Lee Pennington. Mm -hmm. And he can tell you the story of the true story of King Arthur. Right. Really? Uh, we're, we're, we always love to have interesting people. I love on, King so, Arthur. Yeah. Okay. King Arthur. There were two King Arthurs that are conflated in history, but the most famous one was killed here in Kentucky by American Indians, and then his body transported back to Wales, where it was buried later. And you have to take that uh, and and run with that. I like, I like it. Yes, we would be interested absolutely. Uh, yeah, years ago when I lived in Indianapolis, I had read that somebody had found a, a lot of uh, ancient armor on a on an island in the Ohio River here, not far from where I live. And uh, I always thought that was fascinating and said, yeah, that would happen. But nobody knows what happened to all the armor and stuff. And the, uh, there was a big fort built, fortress built up that uh, Lewis and Clark saw when they came through and right. President, Jefferson, President Jefferson wouldn't look at it. Right. But over the years, over the years, it was quarried away and destroyed. Mm. But it was a mass. They call it the uh, the Gibraltar of the Ohio River. Is what it's called. I think at one time it was a huge fortress, and nobody knows who built it or when. But you guys have some very fascinating sites, and I mean, you just look at all the mounds throughout the United States. I mean, they're finding traces that the Incas and the Mayans may have made it all the way into the northern United States as well what are your thoughts yeah. on that yeah there lee can give you lectures on each one of these things <laughs> right lee, lee used to be the port laureate of uh, kentucky and uh i'll i'll tell him about you guys and let you get in cut, touch with him he's yeah he's got, he's got a thousand stories about a million things and uh, well we'd love <laughs> it if, if he's interested in you know like you know two three million people listening it's the latest <laughs> absolutely the latest thing he did last weekend uh, was a he and his fiance had gone to Bosnia to look at the pyramids mm -hmm. there, and he gave a he's he's made movies about these places. Yes, I'm I'm not a fan of Bosnian pyramids myself. I don't think they're real. Oh, that's fascinating because it's that quite must, a large one that they've discovered. That must make for a great conversation between the two of you. Well, he 
we don't argue with friends. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> it, it would be an interesting conversation. It doesn't but, have to be uh, an argument. The famous, uh, the famous writer and explorer and professor Robert Schock, you know, who talked about the Sphinx, he thinks that they were, the Bosnian pyramids are not real. Hmm. And my friend Chris Dunn, who's been over there, thinks they're not real. Hmm. And, uh, but that's, there's so many interesting things in the world that we agree on. It's not worth it's that more, kind of It's stuff. a curiosity. I, I'd be really curious to hear why he I, thinks uh, that they're not, you know, or why people well, think that they are. I met back in 2010, I was at a conference in Houston with my friend Chris Dunn and uh, Sam Asmajanich. Dr. Sam, the guy who discovered them, the pyramids, and they had good good conversations about that. There's there's just so many things in the world that I think are concrete. Well, I hate to use that word, but are real and solid. We can agree on, like these things in the bottom of Lake Michigan. How come that's not? The, how come there's not a museum up there that demonstrates and shows all this stuff? And people studying, getting master's and doctor's degrees, studying. Um, at the bottom of the lake, I don't you know? think that they've known about. I think it's fairly recent discovery, maybe in the last handful of years. Um, well, but, but, I mean, look at less, less, ten years at least. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at even off the coast of of Cuba, down there, there is another. There's a city there, like cities, even in the Azores. You know, like they're discovering pyramids and cities underwater. I mean, we know we, we we know where there's two continents that are underwater that you know we we don't really acknowledge. You don't see it on the maps. You don't see it on the globes. But we know that they're there where they used to be, and that's what I'm saying. When you know history has a way, or the the planet, whatever the case may be, it levels things out with ice ages and so on. Meteor strikes wiped out the dinosaurs. You know. Uh, it, it has a way of purging itself, but it also has a way over time um, of making things come to the surface. And I think maybe they find in Lake Michigan, I think that, you know, there's probably more all over the place, but technology now is allowing us to find some of these places like LIDAR, being able to let us look down right. to the canopies right. of South America, for example. Um, and find civilizations that have been hidden under the canopy there for, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, well, hundreds of years for sure, not thousands, even maybe thousand years. But I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, we, I, it would be nice to excavate it all, but I just don't think it's possible. Well, can't ex excavate it. But, uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking right now, it's too bad that some countries in the world want to be like Russia is. I mean, the cost of that war in Ukraine, besides yeah. the human life, the human lives that are being wasted by the damn Russians, the cost of that war in one day would probably finance a hundred archaeological expeditions. Right. Like President I, President Eisenhower said, every missile built, every tank, every warplane is built, could build a school or a hospital. Yes. Or in my country, I'd like to see <laughs> go out and use lidar over the whole world, and yeah. uh, send a hundred expeditions underwater and scour everything and do that stuff, but. Unfortunately, when there's bad people in the world doing bad things, we, we have to defend ourselves. But what? It's a there shame. is an archaeologist that uses satellite technology to find pyramids and has found ancient cities and pyramids throughout Egypt by using I thought, satellites. I thought, I thought she had done that, yeah. Yeah, so it, the technology, I think, allows for it. Um, but I guess it's just a matter of which countries will allow it. Egypt is so into, they're finding new stuff every day. Yeah, my my friend Chris Dunn uh, is wrote books about Egypt. You know, he's a power plant, lost technologies of ancient Egypt, and uh, and he's he's got actually uh, now there are Arabic translations of his books. And oh, Arabic wow. Egyptian engineers, okay. young Egyptian engineers and scientists are getting interested in what he's written, so they can reclaim their own heritage. So that's a wonderful thing that they're they're it doing. Is. They're, that's what I, in Peru. That's the reason one of the reasons I wrote the book about Kiaramak. I wanted local Peruvians to go out there and study the thing. I mean, yes. I can't do it thousands of miles away and uh, let them study it. Let them talk to the local people, see what legends and stories there are around and other artifacts and uh, dig it up and appreciate the culture. Right. I, mean, I can appreciate they, well, that. 
and speech, speaking of technology, as, as far as I know, I might have been the very first and only person so far to take a sculpture like that, model it in 3D to figure out what its functions were, not just as a as something ornamental or ritual, but actually mm -hmm. a, a working instrument. And I don't know that anybody else has ever done that. I just used a readily available uh, 3D CAD software right. and, uh, and proved it. Right. And so uh, th there's no telling how much other ancient stuff we could look at, like you say, with modern technology and analyze it. And one of the things I originally went to Peru for was this, the Soweti stone. The Soweti stone, I saw it on television many years ago. And I looked at it and said, that's a hydraulic model. So I was at a World Science Fiction Convention in 1986 in Atlanta. And I'd just seen this thing on television. And I was at a party, a drunken party. And uh, there's one lady there talking. She was an archaeologist from South America. Just moved back to the States. And I said, uh, do you, uh, and I talked to her about this model stone. And she said, oh, yeah, we've got a lot of those down in Central South America. I said, have you ever found mercury in any of those? She said, yeah, there are traces of mercury in a lot of them. We have no idea why. I said, I know why. But I said, stay, stay here. I'll be right back. I've got to refill some drinks. And so I got back and she was gone. <laughs> no, oh, of course. No. <laughs> what it was, I right. had, when I was right. studying that stone, I said, how would you model? Well, I first did it with the pyramids. I was concerned about water flow in pyramids. I wanted to make a model of the Great Pyramid and fill it with something that would act like water would. But you can't scale down water. You have to, uh, if I was going to make a pyramid the size of two by feet, two feet square, you can't use water. It wouldn't work the same way. There's a thing called dimensional analysis and water has got a, mm. a density and a surface tension and stuff. You know, the closest thing I could find was liquid mercury that would work. So I figured they'd probably use liquid mercury. So when I saw that model of the Suwede stone in Peru, I said they would probably use liquid mercury. So in 2012, when I went there with my son, I, I, I bought a uh, mercury detection kit from Israel, I think it was. Mm. And I went there to see the Suwede stone. And uh, I didn't find any traces of mercury, unfortunately. But it was on the way to the Suwede stone that we saw the sign about the Kia I said, well, let's come back tomorrow and go look at that, other, that place. Well, that key room became almost an obsession with me after that. And I spent a lot of time on it. Right. So, but I was able to prove it. So it made me feel good. Well, what do you think about when you look at discoveries like that? Do you think it's something that primitive people of the time could have done? Or do you think maybe that, you know, because let's face it, when you look at ancient monuments and you look at, you know, hieroglyphs, petroglyphs, that sort of thing, they emulated what they saw. Do you think it's possible that a more advanced culture could have come down and assisted them in creating some of the things that you saw or well, that, that exists down in Peru and other countries? That's funny. I'm, I'm writing a novel about that very thing right now. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll Maybe, try to uh, get out of your head. <laughs> but it's, uh, well, that's been bouncing around a long time. There's not a lot of archaeological proof, but I have a gut feeling that before that younger Dryas cataclysm and whatever it was that hit the earth, there were other civilizations on earth that were advanced. Right. And uh, they probably went around and taught people things. The uh, Now, there are, there are only so many ways of make, cutting stone and building stuff like that. So a lot of that just... It's going to be a natural result. It's not being taught, but but I don't think there's any reason that the the brains of people living in Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, would be any different than the brains of people living in Italy or Greece or Egypt. You know, I mean, mm. uh, the I was going to say about that Suwede stone. There's a lost technology built into it. It's been there for hundreds or thousands of years, and nobody ever knew it. In the Eastern part of Peru, on the Pacific Coast side, there's not much rain. There's a desert over there. But yet, tens of thousands of people used to live there. And they could never understand how could they irrigate properly and raise enough crops to have a population like that. Well, they found it. Archaeologists finally found it, what it was, I think, in the 80s. They used a system called Waru Waru. 
if you look at it from the top, it's like your fingers, your fingers are raised areas of earth and the, in between the fingers is water. They had these little mounds of dirt about maybe a foot high and they did them in a finger-like thing like that where there's mm -hmm. water in and out. And the water wasn't very deep. It was only about a foot deep. And uh, it turns out in those dark skies at night, the, the temperature of the earth rises toward the uh, black sky and it creates a, a fog of water above these little uh, mounds of dirt where you've got your plants planted mm. as a microclimate. And that is very conducive to raising crops. And they were able to make all kinds of crops. Well, in the 80s, they discovered that that technology again. And it's mm. now used in China and all over South America. But right. when you look at, and this is what clued me on when I first looked at TV at the Suede Stone, being a model. And the Suede Stone there are examples of that. You pour water on the top of it, it comes down and runs into these little areas. So that Suede stone, which was there for hundreds or thousands of years, had that technology, irrigation technology built into it, demonstrated for anybody to go see. But yet it, the technology itself was not rediscovered until the last century. Mm -hmm. Yet the people in the Corral on the west side of the Indies had been using that that technology and the people on the east side of the Indies where we saw it, cop, you know, put it in stone and documented it. So I was wondering what else in that that model, that stone model. So weighty stone is about 13 feet long, eight feet wide and uh, eight feet high. And it's got 200 uh, figures and carvings and specialty items carved into it. And uh, at the bottom of it are the Waru Waru irrigation fingers and like i said that that was a lost technology but it actually existed on that stone for everybody mm -hmm. to see for hundreds of years right what else is out there that we, we're looking at and we don't understand that we could learn from right now right and, right and that, those are macro things that if there was an ancient technology of nanotech quantum technology in the ancient times i mean okay put it this way Science has only existed for what five hundred years. I mean, uh, well, that for, for our current civilization, yeah. let's face it, we're not the first kick at the can at this planet. Yeah, no, but I'm saying the science that we know about. <laughs> yes, and we we can trace back every invention except for fire and the wheel, just about in the stirrup. We can trace it back to where it started, and apparently either the person who did it or the culture that did it. But. Uh, what, and that's only in like 500 years. What if there was another island somewhere in the, on the world that had existed for, instead of 500 years, for 5,000 years without wars and earthquakes and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. And they'd had science for 5,000 years instead of 500 years. Right. So this could have been your ancient civilization. Uh, to me, the most logical place would be Indonesia. Somewhere in Indonesia, uh, there might have been an island before the Younger Dryas Cataclysm came and flooded everything. Uh, maybe there was a society there that had science for 5,000 years. And they developed everything we have and more. But they were not interested in taking over the world. They were interested in staying home and doing whatever they wanted. Mm. And if they came up with micro machines and nanotechnology... Even if we saw it today, we wouldn't recognize it. Maybe we couldn't even see it. You might think it was dust. Mm. The reason I say Indonesia, you know, you've heard of Gunung Panang, the mm. pyramid in Indonesia. This right. carbon dated mm. for 24,000 years old. Right. And it's real. This It's not a controversial like Bosnia is. This is real. Well, is Bosnia, this one in Russia, that's huge. They believe that was a cradle of civilization. Like there's a lot of research being done to some of well, these locations. I'm sorry. In, until Russia becomes a civilized country, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't believe anything that comes out of them. Right. They right. To me, they are worse. They are worse than the Nazis. Right. They killed more people than the Nazis did. Right. And so, I, I, I took Russian 60 years ago during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was taking Russian from a Russian, and the, 
I wanted to learn what I needed just in case, but uh, mm. I have nothing but utter disgust for the whole society. And I'm, I make a prediction that with five years, Russia won't exist like it does now. It'll be 20 different little countries all squabbling get, with each other. We're going to get Yeah, right we, we, that's best suited for a political show that we're not. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have YouTube's going to boot us off. <laughs> oh, okay. They'll boot us yeah. live. Yeah. 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 Well, you, can, you can censor me because. Yeah. Hey, Maybe we yeah. can do it on Twitter. Elon won't, won't censor us. I was just going, that's what I was trying to say earlier when you were saying, I hope Elon's getting us out there. I think there's a lot of things. I believe that Elon's doing a lot without saying too much. He's smarter than that. Yeah, he's smarter than a lot of things. A couple of, he, he's, he's another one that shouldn't make political statements. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I don't mean political statements. I'm saying with the Mars thing, I really believe that there's a lot more he's doing that we don't know about yet. Uh, on the Mars thing, I wrote a story that was published a few years ago in an anthology called Earth. <laughs> Stories about Mars, but the anthology is called Earth. A story called I Hate Mars. And it turns out the basis of the story is that we land on Mars we finally find microbial life, bacterial life, vir viral life, and it's deadly to mankind. It's deadly to all earthly things, which is one of the reasons, by the way, I, I'm with all those people who don't want to bring any Mars samples back to Earth. Uh -uh. Bring them to the moon, maybe, but don't bring them to Earth. So it turns out in the story that people can't want to bring any Mars samples. It turns out that people can't live on Mars, and so they send robots down. And they're mm -hmm. able to transfer parts of human consciousness into robots for uh, people who are under death sentences or life pr prison sentences, life sentences in prison. And so the story takes place. There's a guy who was high and drunk and killed a bunch of kids by his car wreck. And then they sentenced him either death or go to Mars. And so he said, well, how bad can it be? So he's, his consciousness is put in a little robot and he ro wanders around Mars. That's how the story starts. But hmm. the premise, my, my fear is that there might be microbes on Mars that interact with us in a bad way. And uh, as silly as NASA has been with all this stuff, you know, they've only sent, they've only sent two probes to Mars that, to detect life. And they both did. 1976, both Mars landers, the Viking landers, both detected life. Hmm. And uh, they shut them down. And the only reason they had light detection on at that time is Carl Sagan demanded that there be. Uh, I had a, I worked for a guy who was there when Carl Sagan came in when they were working on the Mars landers and demanded that uh, they put life detection on it. And nobody believed that they think, well, it should be geology. We're not interested in life. But since then, they've had no no life detection machines. All they've got right now is uh, all kind of geological stuff, but they don't have anything. Mm -hmm. I keep hoping that they will find a fossil. One of these probes will find a fossil there that you can't deny, or an artifact like a, a spear. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I guess I could talk about it now. I had talked to somebody who knew somebody who was working on one of those probes I said, why don't you put an arrowhead, spring-loaded arrowhead on one of the landers. So after it lands, it springs a little arrowhead out where uh, where the cameras can pick it up. And I said, if you did that, we would have a manned Mars program the next week. Right. And the guy said, I don't think we'd want to do that. I said, I really wish I had. Apparently right. they didn't. They didn't want to do it, but right. Do you I think that a lot of people speculate that Mars is actually a dead planet? It was dead. Mm -hmm. No well, core, just. I I don't know. I I have this basic feeling, just because I'm a human, I guess, that the universe, with all the rules and laws and phenomena that it has has a driving mission to create life 
intelligent life mm-hmm. and probably life even beyond what we are. Maybe of course. spiritual yes. life or some other life. And that, that I, I believe that someday they'll find some kind of plant life on the moon for God's sake. And right. I, I think on Mars, they're going to find, they're going to find living things on Mars. Mm-hmm. And uh, I hope we recognize them and I just don't want to bring them back here and let them loose on earth. Right. Because you think smallpox amongst the, the Incas and Aztecs was bad. And we, we, we stand, for the, for the yeah, don't, don't we stand that risk even in, in the ice here on the planet as things thaw out, scientists have found, um, you know, diseases and, and viruses and, uh, microbes that have just been frozen in the permafrost and this is starting to thaw out and there's a concern with that as mm-hmm. well. It could be. I mean, uh, I saw that. Yeah, we've defrosted a 40,000 year old virus. I know, what what could possibly go wrong? I think we've all seen that movie, you know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sadly. And we talk about we're talking about the global warming and the ice and the glaciers and everything. And I saw a headline last week, I think it was. Last year was the warmest year in 800 or 125,000 years on earth. And and as an engineer I just wanted to moan. Okay, first off, we don't know what the temperature of the world was mm-hmm. in 1823. Fair enough, yes. And uh, the ice cores we have, like I said, from the last million years show that uh, there was a medieval warm period, a lot warmer than this right now. We are actually in, a, in between an ice age right now. And they were actually colder right now than we have been in a long time and uh we're gradually inching back up to normal now what is normal i mean Mm -hmm. i it it's not true it is not true that this the world's hotter than it's ever been right uh and this the glaciers can prove it i yeah i keep reading about uh people in norway archaeologists in norway and sweden and finland uh, as the glacier is removed, they're finding artifacts and habitations as the glaciers are melting. said, how terrible this is. And wait a minute. That means that when the, before the glaciers came, there were people living there. Mm-hmm. When a glacier moves back and you find things from people living there, that meant it must have been warmer in the old days than it is now. Right. They never make that correlation. And I always thought this is ridiculous. I mean, I'm not a scientist. I'm an engineer. I'm an engineer who deals in practical things. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you find something where the ice was, they showed people were living there. That meant people were living there before the ice came. And what does that mean? It was warmer. <laughs> so Right, right. The whole thing. Right. It, it gets right. into a political thing. I don't want to get into. But, the planet uh, has changed many times. Um, you know, there's locations and out of place artifacts that have been found that go back, you know, hundreds of millions of years, billions of years. You know, we look at it with amazement and trying to figure out, well, how long has, you know, how long ago was that? You know, ancient civilizations, maybe more advanced civilizations, yet some of these locations are pretty primitive, but it just goes to show that we're not the first civilization here, that it's happened a few times before us. And and very possibly, just like as per your book, that there'll be more civilizations that will be here long after we have departed. You know, if there's anything left of the planet and judging that we don't get hit by a supernova or an asteroid, you know, life has a way of fixing itself and replenishing itself over thousands of years or hundreds of years, whatever the case may be. Yeah, that's that's why I want to get people off and get people on other worlds. So no matter what happens to this one, right. human rights can go on. I mean, uh, I right. I'm not supposed to announce it, but I have a new great grandson that was just born yesterday. And uh, Ooh, congratulations! Oh, congratulations. We, have, we have to wait. We have to wait until everybody is okay about. What his name is and where, where he was born, but it, it wasn't in the United States. Yeah, right. Anyhow, of course, very nice. Yeah, 
but I, I like to think I like to think these guys, these little guys. He's got a sister, and I have a lot of. I have eleven grandkids, and now two great grandkids. Wow. And I'm, hope, I'm hoping that somewhere in those genes, some piece of me will be out there standing on Mars someday, and right, maybe, who knows? Maybe on stars. And right. if we ever, if we ever finally make friendly and beneficial contact with whatever these things are flying around our own earth. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe actually some of us will actually get to see th other stars, other star systems. Right. Oh. So to me, it's, it's obvious that somebody somewhere, something has got a means of, I wouldn't say traveling. I would just say being from other places, mm -hmm. other stars. Right. And I, I just like to think there's a future out there. I hope, that what we have right now is not the best that, that mankind has ever done. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, we don't play well in the sandbox, do we? <laughs> like no, I say, I think we all agree on that. If, if I ever, if if I ever get to meet, to meet the creator, and he, he or she pays any attention to me, I got a few suggestions. Right. As a, design, as a design engineer, I have a few questions. I have a few suggestions for improvement. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I, I mean. You know, I think that we all have to learn how to coexist with one another better. I think we we have a lot of ego out there. We have a lot of power struggles. We have, you know, there, there's a lot of things that make people tick. And I just think that, you know, it's all within us. We don't have a whole lot of control over what goes on in the world, but we how we handle it and how we handle one another we do have control over. It's the only thing we have control over is ourselves, our own thoughts, our own actions. Um, you know, I think that, that there's a lot of potential for people. Yeah. But, I, have uh, I have hope in that. Yeah, other people recognize this too. I Probably about 30 years ago, maybe longer, I was having, I don't remember why now, but I was, at a low point, I was very depressed for some reason. I don't remember what now. And I was just looking for something. So I started reading my great books that I had. And Marcus Aurelius, the emperor, mm -hmm. I was reading him. And I thought, well, here's a guy 2,000 years ago writing stuff that appeals to me now. This, this is amazing. It's like he's a modern guy. Right. And he had a, he had a statement there that stunned me and lifted me up and still does. Is basically what he was saying in modern terms is this, we can't control what the gods throw at us. All we can control is our response to it. Right. In other words, That's right. you can't control what life gives you, but you can control how you react to it. Correct. And uh, I said, that that's something everybody needs to learn at an early age. Uh, I mm -hmm. love the words that he spoke back then. That was, mm -hmm. that was But we astounding. have to teach it to the next generation as well. Yeah, so bad things happen. I mean, catastrophic things happen. And uh, you can either totally fall apart and go berserk and die, or you can, mm -hmm. you know, live with it and uh, accommodate it and, uh, and go forward. I agree. And I agree. And, and you pay it forward. And you have, we have to teach the next generation and the generation after that because. If you don't, what kind of a legacy do we leave? Oh, I could give you I could give you an example, but I can't. YouTube would probably disown me. I could <laughs> give an example of a current society that only teaches hate, and you see what it brings up on them. But anyhow, that's something else. Let's go back to more. Right. <laughs> I'll have to put back. you on Joe's politics show. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you and guys you can, can go crazy. Uh, can yeah. <laughs> um, so who, who, basically, who what, so when do you think? I mean, do you think there's a lot of talk right now about um, essentially disaster or coming? Scientists are predicting. Okay, you know, we we've just near we're we're close to disaster. That this comet or this asteroid is just going close to us. The sun is constantly putting out some pretty big solar flares. Do you think we're closer to falling into an ice age or catastrophic event? Or do you think that, you know, 
we really should be concerning ourselves with it so soon. Well, I think we're much closer to a an ice age than we are to a so-called global, you know, a, a global heat wave that's going to kill everything. Right. I mean, the the Malinkovich, you can look it up, you know, Malinkovich, I think it is Malinkovich. Anyhow, look them up. Mm -hmm. Every hundred thousand years. And it has to do with inclination of the earth and how far out the earth is from the sun. That is all these cosmic things. Mm -hmm. That doesn't change. That can't change, you know, short of right. collisions or something. Uh, and the thing about, to me, the thing about global warming and all the catastrophes, they talk about global warming. When we're at the 1.5 or 2.0 centigrade and everything's going to die and everything. That's nonsense. And I've, I've demonstrated, and you can look up for yourself the NOAA charts. Greenland and and Vostok, the Russians did in in the Antarctica, mm -hmm. the ice cores. The uh, no, this is this is the coldest it's been in a long time. Right. And uh, the, the dinky little thing about going up one or two degrees makes no difference at all. Right. And they they've shown photographs of uh, different cities around the world from 150 years ago, and the sea level hasn't changed at all. What happens in the places where seas are flooding is because they're sinking, like Venice. Venice right. is built on logs. It's right. going to sink eventually. Yeah. Miami, Miami is built all over uh, all kind of uh, caverns and stuff, and mm -hmm. they're, they're going to sink. And so nothing's sinking, and no islands in the Pacific have gone under. Right. And, and right. that's typically, if you read the international press about the, uh, the IPCC that reports on this, even they don't say that, but the ignorant reporters and journalists who report on it, okay, it's not going to make a headline. It's, hey, the world's doing okay. We're happy. That doesn't, you know, sell anything. But if it bleeds, it leads. You know, they, they sell about television news. They say, right. Uh, right. you want catastrophes. You want, I mean, uh, hey, Al, Al Gore, you know, I was talking about years ago, about a year, 2000. 2005, there's not going to be any ice anywhere. Well, guess what? You know, uh, it was snowing in Santa Fe last week. Uh, they had one of the biggest snows in the world up in Alaska recently. I mean, you know, weather changes. Too many politicians who are not scientists want to make a career based on catastrophes. Now, science fiction writers are guilty of it too. I mean, uh, I've written one of my books. It was about a nanotech catastrophe that silicon blood a kill off 700 million people in the book. It's a catastrophe sells. It's more interesting to watch something about a dystopia than it is a utopia. Mm -hmm. You watch a TV show about how beautiful the it is in the future and there's no troubles. Well, if there's no troubles, mm -hmm. there's not a story. Right. So we have to learn how to tell different stories. But hey, if you have, for God's sake, that, that stupid movie, The Walking Dead, a catastrophe show that every day, every week is a catastrophe and everybody know dies and comes back as a zombie. Do you, uh, do you think it's a cat that's catastrophic that's, I mean, thing? Do you think it's a survival I, thing? Maybe I it's a survival uh, part of that. I don't. First of all, I have friends that write that stuff and they write all kind of military stuff and future warfare. I'm right. glad. First of all, I'm glad that everybody makes a living at it and I don't disparage anybody reading anything, almost anything at least. And, uh, but I'm I'm not in for it. I well, like I said, I want a different kind of science fiction. I want the kind of six, science fiction I used to read when I was fourteen. Mm -hmm. Right, simpler uh, times, maybe. Pardon? Not so, simpler times, not so complicated. Well, uh, the things that I used to read about when I was a kid are happening now. So mm. <laughs> I have a whole bookshelf over to my left here, Robert Heinlein books. Right. The, our, his his book Red Planet was the first one I ever read back when I was nine years old. Wow! <clears throat> a bare, barefoot kid on a dirt road in Arkansas, and my cousin picks up a book out of the county bookmobile and hands it to me. And it's called Red Planet. He says, "I know you like funny books about the future. Here's here's a book. Funny. I love that. <laughs> well, we, I know you funny like books. funny books, uh, comic books. It's before books science books. fiction became political. Well, no, actually, it was." Red Planet was about our American Revolution on Mars, so it was not. It was it was always political. All of Heinlein stuff was political, but wow, 
But there I was, I read, sat down under a tree and read that book that, that afternoon and gave it to my cousin. So that's pretty good. Is there any more stuff like that? And of course, now I have a whole shelf full of Heinlein stuff that 50 <laughs> books of his that, yeah, there was, there was stuff like that. And uh, over the years, well, reading science fiction drove me into becoming an engineer. Right. So at age 18, I started working at White Sands Missile Range as a mm-hmm. telescope missile tracker. Right. And then later on, I worked on the ABM, anti ballistic missiles. Then I worked on secret stuff at some national labs. Then I worked at the White House Science Office. But the thing that drove me, in fact, I think the thing that made my career for me was science fiction. I had a science fictional mind. I was very creative. They used to come to me when they wanted creative solutions to things. Mm-hmm. I don't think I was that I wasn't the best engineer I knew by far. I knew a lot of people smarter and better than me, but I didn't know anybody who could think as weird as I do. And right. uh, they, some people appreciated that and I did all right. And uh, right. finally, so- uh, and I made some contributions along the way. I saved the taxpayers some money mm-hmm. for the different projects I was on. And, uh, but science fiction was always there to save me from insanity, I think. Right. Well, it takes you away for a little while. And uh, so most of this, I probably wrote 100 short stories, and most of them deal with technology and the humorous or disastrous effects or ap- of the applications, the wrong applications of them. Right. And right. Then the other book, I don't know if you have that one there, called Valley of the Shaman that I wrote, was was partially true. My son and I were visiting uh, the Hamas Valley in New Mexico, which is northwest of Albuquerque, and uh, we were looking at the ruins of a Catholic church. But in the in the ruins of that Catholic church, there was a kiva, you know, the American Indian kiva, the yeah. holy place. And I said, here that is in a church. That's that. There must be a story behind yeah. that. Then I heard, I swear, I heard a voice say write about this. And so I turned to my son and I said, what did you say? He said, I didn't say anything. Are you hearing voices again, Dad? I said, oh, God. So anyway, I wrote that book, <laughs> Valley of the Shaman. And it's fictional. It's kind of a journey through uh, this valley and the guy has to right. return a an ancient artifact to its original place. And uh, again, as I wrote it, it was like automatic writing. The, the valley exists. The the places I wrote in it don't really exist, except in my own mind. And uh, there, uh, so I don't know if you're interested. If you're interested in the weird stuff, I, I'll put it this way. Early on, I read Charles Fort back when I was a young man. A friend gave me the books of Charles Fort as a gift in college. <coughs> Charles Fort wrote all kinds of strange things about strange events. And he says, you know, basically science looks in the bright corners, the bright lights and everything. But it, it, but if you look in the dark corners, you might find things scuttling around there that nobody knows about. Right. I, I like that phrase. And I thought, well, okay, I'll, I know I'm not ever going to be the world's best engineer or, or scientist or anything like that. But if I look at places other people don't pay attention to, maybe I can find something. So I'm going to look in those little dark corners, the mm-hmm. weird things. Right. So I've always been interested in anomalies, ancient civilizations, the paranormal, flying saucers. Uh, yeah, you, you know, definitely have to go on with haunting, Joe. <laughs> hauntings, uh, and I've done, I've done, you know, I've done haunted house investigations mm-hmm. in, a, mm-hmm. in a U.S. Army facility. I've done, I've observed all kind of psychic stuff going on. I mean, hundreds of times, and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and. So I, I know precognition is real. This occurred. I know telepathy is real. This occurred. I know PK, somebody starting a fire or an accident when they say it's going to happen and it happened. I've seen that happen. And uh, so mm. I always would like to take these really bright scientists and engineers that I know and fund them and change their minds and make them start looking at these things. Right. Look at you. Right. I, there's no telling what we can find. I mean, I have a friend who taught remote viewing, and he also taught 
how to bend things with your mind. And he showed mm -hmm. me all these spoons and knives and stuff that he had. Uh, like telekinesis. Twisted and everything. And uh, I thought, well, if there's, Lynn, if, if that's real, and obviously it's real because he's done it hundreds of times. Right. There's got to be some kind of physical force that causes that. And I would like for scientists to study that, see what it is, and maybe we could mechanize it. Then we could apply it and use it for uh, factories and stuff. And right. I would engineer. It'd be nice to have a machine that you push a button and it poof, something comes out. Well, you know, 3D printing is close to that, but uh, right. not right. there yet. Right. So you, well, there's so many things that we should be studying that were ignored. And it, Charles Fort called them his books, the book of the damned, the book of the damned. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about facts that are damned. Right. The facts are real. They're there. They're just damned because everybody refuses to look at them. They re refuse to study them. They refuse to research them. And uh, I was reading something on that about Charles Fort today, the way he approached things. Mm -hmm. It was quite interesting that uh, all the weird stuff is all in one thing as far as I'm concerned. There's nothing weird. There's not, I don't believe in supernatural. It's just things we don't understand yet. It's high strangeness. We, it's just something things, that's out of the norm. Things we choose to ignore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I got a drink here. Sometimes I wonder if, you know, they are studying this. We just don't know about it. Well, CIA studied all kinds of it. So there's definitely yeah. an interest. But I, well, I, I mean, I, even though they've said, no, we have, you know, we have no use for this. I believe that it's still continued. Mm -hmm. Well, I won't say who. Excuse me. <laughs> I, know, I know some people in CIA that I talked right. to about weird things. And this one lady I talked to in D.C., uh, this has been... Gosh, eight or ten years ago, she says, "I know Arlen. Uh, first of all, I had a I founded a science fiction think tank called Sigma, and we met with CIA and a bunch of other people just to share ideas and things. And a couple of people we kind of resonated with. And this one lady talked to me. She says, "I know you're interested in weird things." She said, "Would you believe that the CIA investigated a haunted house?" I said, "I'll believe anything now." I said, <laughs> She said, well, what happened was there was this congresswoman, and I won't mention who it was, but uh, she uh, swore that this one house was haunted and demanded that CIA look into it with all the instruments and stuff. And so we did. Wow. I said, I said did you find anything? She said, nope. She says, but I'll, uh, I'll put you in touch with somebody who's interested in this stuff, but she never did. And... Uh, but I thought that's cool. That's, that's one thing I'm, I approve of. I mean, I I met all kind of people over the years, especially on work at the White House who work for the agency. Mm -hmm. the, the cards they the cards they gave you always had something else on them. So I wrote down CIA and one guy said, "Do not write that on there." I bought this is the company. I'm engineering. Company. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. And I talked. I talked to one guy. <clears throat> he used to be well known, but uh, talked to him about UFOs hmm. <clears throat> in, in 1960 about a week after my first son was born there was a UFO sighting in Las Cruces <clears throat> in New Mexico where I was going to school and if things had been a little bit different I would have been there I was a missile tracker and we had to catch a bus to White Sands two and a half hours before the scheduled shoot. So we'd be sure to get there, check in, take a truck and drive out to the tracking station. So we were due to be picked up by an army bus at 3.30 in the morning this one day at the bottom of this hill next to a uh, place called Three Crosses Hill in Las Cruces. And there are three crosses up there the town is named after. And uh, there was a golf course up there. Well, at 3.30 that morning, a couple of cops were driving by and they saw a glowing light at the top of that hill, a big glowing light. And they were afraid that something had crashed. And so they got out of the car and scrambled up the side of this little mesa, probably 20 feet high. And they saw a big green glowing object that lifted up dripping green flame and shot out over the mountains to the east, over the Oregon mountains. It was spotted by people at White Sands that night and security guards at Holloman Air Force Base. And the Holloman Air Force Public Information Office the next day said it was probably a meteorite. 
Now, I never heard of a meteorite that took off and went over the mountains, took off from the ground and went up. But anyhow, the thing was, at the last minute that day before we were going home, they canceled the shoot that morning. So the whole group of us didn't have to show up at work. So we were not there at that bus stop at 3.30 in the morning. 3.30 in the morning is when that UFO sighting occurred. I just can imagine that if it had been a whole bus load of White Sands people, like 50 people there at the bottom of that thing, and we saw it take off, that would have been quite the sighting. But the shoot was canceled, and we we just were not there. But pure chance. It's like, that was like, like uh, I, have a, I have a newspaper, but <clears throat> September 1960. And they have a says their comments on Chris's UFO um, where in there they, wow. they said they, they said probably a meteorite. <laughs> Is and, that a go-to line for them? <laughs> so I asked this one CIA guy I met at a party about that. I knew he was interested in it. I said, he said, what bothers you about that? And I said, well, it bothers me. It wasn't investigated. He said, just because you don't know anything about it doesn't mean it wasn't investigated. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, thank you. So I figured they did investigate it. Now, uh, but that that was not his job description. His job description was much more mundane. I think about agriculture in Afghanistan or something like that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I, with all the recent revelations <clears throat> about UFOs, the Grush testimony before Congress back in July, and the SOL conference, the SOL conference at Stanford last weekend, it looks like it might be coming to a head. I'm mm -hmm. interested in UFOs because <clears throat> I was 10 years old in Arkansas one night talking to my mother and a preacher in the front yard. And I saw a light shoot across the sky. I thought it was a moon. So it really, really scared me. It was the size and shape and the color and brightness of the moon. But it went sinusoidal across the sky like, like that. And... Uh, so I've believed in strange things in the sky ever since, ever since that night. I was ten, right. and especially uh, when you witness it, we photographed some something strange at White Sands one time from our telescope, and uh, I won't say who it was. But if I, if my friend happens to be watching the show, he was there. He and I photographed. He could call in and tell you about it. But uh, mm -hmm. we did that, and then there have been so many thousands of reports, hundreds of thousands of reports that uh, I did a, uh, an article 1980 for this book, Encyclopedia of UFOs. Oh my goodness. Wow. Oh and yeah. Then, and then I did a follow on in the article in 19 or I guess 1999 or maybe it was for this wow. book. Yeah. And uh, in there, they ask our opinions of what UFOs were. And I said, well, I think they're actually physical craft from other worlds mm -hmm. that are capable of uh, advanced means of propulsion and materialization. And when we finally do figure out what they are, or we finally know what they are, we have to decide whether it was worth knowing or we wish we didn't know <laughs> or uh, it might yeah. be something else. And, yeah, and, and from what I'm reading, some people lately are saying you know, it might be that well, you don't really want to know. That's a good point, though. Yeah, I mean, it, the uh, one of the people I was reading things about the uh, the Soul Saul Institute conference at Stanford last weekend, and they had people like Jacques Vallee and other people there, and right. I met him, I met him before. I met over the years. I met Stan Freeman, Jacques Vallee, and. Uh, all kind of people in the UFO business. I've re I investigated a few and uh, mm -hmm. wrote a lot of articles and stories about them. And uh, mm -hmm. I do believe that, well, I was interviewed by a guy on radio a couple years ago. He said, well, what do you think? How come they don't just land and talk to us? I said, well, I'll repeat what Stanton Friedman said. You know, I don't try to talk to the squirrels in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> And I oh, saw boy. <laughs> Michio, Michio Kaku yeah. had an even better one than that. And I've used it actually, I'd, I'd used it in a story before. But he said, 
if you have a civilization that's millions or billions of years older than we are, we might not be any better than ants to them. And we don't try to talk to ants. Mm, and, right. Uh, study them. Right. That that could be. It could be. Uh, right. Well, I, it, I, I. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, we're just coming up onto the top of the hour. So I hate to have to cut the conversation, but we've got five minutes. So oh, okay. uh, it was a pleasure. Do you have something coming up that you want to share with everyone? Like pr maybe promote yourself. Do you have, are you writing another book? Are you <clears throat> planning another well, trip event? <coughs> Excuse me for allergies. <clears throat> of course. The, the, the Thaw Trilogy, Thaw, Melt and Flow is out an ebook right now on Amazon, ebook form only, but very mm -hmm. shortly, hopefully within weeks, a week or two, it'll be out. They will all be available in the paperback and hardback. Excellent. Excellent. And so, and just in time for Christmas. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, hardback trilogy for your friends uh, is always good. Right. And you, Hardbacks. And you can Hard see. Covers, I love them. <laughs> there we go. And so, uh, so is that is that the end for this trilogy, or are you going to keep going? I think I'll probably do a, a prequel next to tell how how <clears throat> how Motherland was established, why it's run by women, and how they got that right. magic hair, and uh, right. what happened to the city of Shadowfall, why it was deserted when they finally came across it. And but right. I have to wait for the story to come. I don't make it up. I have to just read it and try to transcribe what occurs. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have another, I have another book coming out from a thing called Three Ravens Press. It's called Paradox Lost. It's a time travel, a very screwy time travel story. Wow. When you can do time travel back and forth. It, in fact, I had to make a chart to keep track of who the heck was doing what. <laughs> right. <laughs> but again, it was, it was a story. And right. part of it part of it was published in analog many years ago too. Right. And, uh, right. It takes place near a pyramid in Mexico, near Chichen Itza. Right. You can't go wrong with time travel. It, no, leaves, it leaves so much to be explored. You can go in so many directions with it. Yeah. One of, my, one of my favorites is Alter the History. That's my mind candy anymore. What I don't want to think. I like to read Alter the History. Right. And uh, right. there are a lot of good books out there about that. So anyhow, I wandered all over the place, but uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for sharing part of your Thanksgiving with us. Yeah. Oh, you're quite welcome. Uh, my wife's waiting for me in the other room now. She might be watching this. I don't know. Right. But... Tell, her, <laughs> tell her happy Thanksgiving from us, and thank you for sharing you with us tonight <laughs> and our <laughs> audience. And congratulations. <laughs> And congratulations. Baby. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And yes. Uh, if you ever want to delve deeper into any other things, just let me know. Absolutely. Absolutely. We shall. And thank you for tuning in with us tonight. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Look forward thank to it again you. someday. Okay. Thank okay. you, Arlen. Okay. Good night. Take Good care. night. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye now. Well, we've come to the end of another very interesting segment on the Outer Realm, very new for us, and, you know, went into many different directions, which was super informative and interesting. So thank you, Dr. Arlen Andrews Sr. for sharing, again, your Thanksgiving with us. Also, big thank you to all of you who tuned into the chat room. Always nice to see everybody so interactive. And we were sort of bouncing around tonight, so we didn't put up as many comments. Um, we wanted to give our guests as much time to speak as possible. So, again, thank you, Folgers Coffee. Thank you, Justin Snicker, a.k.a. Dr. Snick, the sonic surgeon. Thank you, Steve McGinnis. And, guys, again, if you like what you see, please like, subscribe, share, follow, whatever the case may be. We really appreciate you uh, for doing so. Next week, we welcome back our dear friend, Preston Dennett. He's going to be sharing more tales of UFOs and extraterrestrial contact, as well as a scoop on his newest book that's coming up. 
or possibly books. Preston just pumps them right out. <laughs> Thursday night, we welcome the return of Daniel and Teresa Duke, the great-grandchildren of Jesse James, and they're going to be discussing Jesse's connection to the Knights Templar in America, treasure, and a whole lot more. They were awesome to have on the show the last time and looking forward to having them on the show this time. So happy Thanksgiving to those of you in the U.S. who may still be indulging in dessert or, you know, some of the crazy shopping frenzies that are coming up over the weekend. Be safe out there, and we shall see you all next week. Have a great weekend and good night. <laughs>